Hiya buddies, Jose Wire Ninjas. We build systems and circuits of integrity. We're also Dream Media's preferred partner in New Jersey. So, hit us up. <laughs> Today, we're in West Caldwell, New Jersey, where we're gonna go over some fundamental knowledge that you need to perform audio video installations. We're gonna take a look at a pre-wire. We're gonna take a look at the process that I use and deploy in my pre-wires. Um, let's get into it. <laughs> let's go over the process. So, you call me, you want a pre-wire. Okay, we decide how many speakers we want. Very important to decide how many speakers we want to install so we know how many speakers we have to wire. We also have to decide how much throw distance we have for the projector, what projector we're using, and what size screen we're using. With all these details, we can put together, design, you know, um, uh, the circuits, you know, put together a, a, a design for the system as a whole and know where and what circuits we have to place. So, we've made our decisions, we've picked out equipment, we know how many channels we're going to use, we know what screen size and what projector we're going to use. So now, the next step would be getting on site and actually deploying circuits. And as always, I've, I've said this time and time again in some of my videos, you have to establish the origin and destination of the circuits. So that's what we did here first today. So the origin for the circuits would be the rack. Everything's gonna live at the rack. Let's get some light on for you guys. So the rack's going here on this wall. I forgot to blue tape it, I apologize. But the rack we decided with the homeowner is gonna go standing height on this wall. We're gonna do a wall mounted 10U rack. It'll be good for an audio video receiver. It'll be good for a couple of source devices and plenty of spare room for expansion. Now, a couple things at the rack. This is our origin for all the circuits. We did a double gang LV2 uh, pre-construction box, hammered it into the stud. We decided that all the circuits are gonna be pulled through and hung off this box. We might hit a J hook or something up there, but this is where all the circuits emanate. Another thing we should note is that we mark power. We need power for the rack. So we mark that out for the electrician. We let them know we want it to the left side of the stud. We know it's the rack power and we're good for the rack. So that's the origin. Let's take a look at some of the destinations. One of them being the projector. So projector is gonna get Mounted right about where that light is. That's the center of the screen wall. We need an orange box for our low voltage wiring. We need, uh, we marked power. So we're gonna get a blue box there for our 120 volt circuits, our power for the projector. So to establish this point in which we know the projector is gonna get mounted there and we know that all the wiring has to, you know, uh, live there, we take into account the screen size and we put the projector as well as the screen size into a throw distance calculator, and we determine that the projector is gonna go at that location, hence the wiring has to live at that location too. Um, give a little bit of space to the left and right of the mount. Now, speakers. We're doing tower speakers, we're doing a center channel, you know, floor standing, and we're doing bookshelf speakers. So, let's take a look at these boxes we have laid out. We have, Atmos tower speaker, it's four terminals, so I need two audio circuits here. Total of four wires, you know, two, we could do a 14-4, four conductor, or we could do, you know, 14-2 times two. But the goal is to have two audio circuits here because the homeowner went with towers that have an Atmos speaker inside the top of the speaker. Um, next would be subwoofer. The subwoofer we decided with the homeowner that it's gonna go here. Subs here, marked here, we're gonna get an RG6. Uh, or high resistance audio cable located here. It's gonna get terminated with RCA compression. We have power for the subwoofer, very important. Here, we have a center channel speaker. Center channel plus data, CAT6. So, I like to add CAT cable wherever I see fit, and one of those locations is the screen wall. If you're gonna do an IR kit, if you plan to relocate the equipment where you don't have line of sight for the remotes, you're gonna need to place uh, an IR receiver at the screen wall, preferably. You can do it at the projector, but people naturally press the buttons and point the remote at the screen, so it's nice to have an IR receiver at the screen wall. That's why there's gonna be a CAT6 cable there. Um, left speaker, left tower speaker. Again, we have an Atmos built in, so 
We're gonna get audio and two speaker circuits here at this location. One thing to note is also, we like to measure the height of the current receptacles or the receptacles going in, the electrician stuff. We're gonna match this height. That way the, the wall plates are aesthetically pleasing. They're all a matching height. It looks nice, it feels right. Now, a couple other markings you may see. And sorry, I'm getting out of breath. <laughs> so, screen. It's important to measure the screen get the dimensions and kind of get them on the wall so you have a good feel for the placement of things as well. That blue tape in the middle, that's the bottom of the screen. The right tape's the side, the other tape's the other side. It's nothing too crazy or elaborate, but hey, it works, it's all we need. But again, it's, it's important to at least know where this thing is so you know where you should put the tower speaker. Um, I would say screen takes priority over everything. Determine your screen size and then you know you can put the towers or the center channel at the positions. For bookshelf speakers, check it out. As usual, we have an imperfect situation for the surrounding speakers. We don't have a wall here, so no wall there. We have a doorway there, and yeah. The other thing is, usually we have to clear the headspace. People don't, I, I, I go over with each and every client, this is where the speaker should be positioned. However, you're gonna you know, be in the headspace. A lot of people have kids. A lot of people don't want things accessible by the kids. They don't want them climbing up on the speakers. So with the homeowner, we decided the speakers, the bookshelf speakers, the on-wall mounted are gonna go, one's gonna go here and we need an orange gang for that, Steve. And then one's gonna go back here. Uh, we took measurements. We measured the tallest person in the home <laughs> and decided with the homeowner that the speakers are gonna go above this headspace. Um, we also took into account where the seating is going to be. Uh, depending on where the seating is going to be and how much flexibility we have with the throw distance, we also decided like, hey, we don't want the projector directly overhead because they are loud and noisy and stuff like that. A um, couple considerations I want to throw at you guys. The last consideration I think we should mention is that, again, we have to go back here. It's very important. So I usually ask, how's the network? How's the Wi-Fi? Um, usually it's not good or usually there's a mesh network, to be honest. And I don't like mesh networks. They work great, but they're, not a, they're far from a perfect solution. Um, however, the best thing we can do to mitigate any network problems or any streaming problems we're gonna have is to run a hardwired data line, you know, CAT6 minimum, from you know, a working router, a working switch, to back to the rack. So that's something that's very important. I would definitely consider running you know, having at least one data line at the rack location. So we're gonna take it from that white tower router, set it back to the rack, and we'll have hardwired internet connection there. With the one line, we can then, you know, uh, hit a switch. We can expand it into five or 10 or 16 ports if necessary. We only need like two or three ports, so we'll hit a mini switch. But the important thing is get your data to the rack. If you're gonna do a rack installation, you're gonna pre-wire, you're gonna do this proper, very important to have hardwired data at the rack. Even if it means you have to go upstairs, pull a line from upstairs. Um, so I think step one would be the design, the overall design, the choice of how many channels, how many speakers we're doing, um, choice of projector, choice of screen size. Then you take this information, and make an educated decision as to where the speakers are gonna go in the room. Consider, consider the acoustical properties, consider the layout of the room, the structure of the room, the geometry of the room, the seating arrangements, all things to take into account. Um, Headspace also, screen size, you have to know where the screen is so the towers can go there, but um, with all this information, you can then establish the origin and destination for each circuit. And the most efficient and accurate way to get this thing done is this, having our orange boxes in place. If you have these all in place and you go over with the homeowner or yourself, the homeowner, make sure you know where you want. Like if you're having someone wire up the house, have this discussion, take a look at this video, watch it a few times, have this discussion with your contractor, make sure that you're taking all these things into consideration, placing your low voltage boxes where things are gonna be placed or installed, and make sure you know exactly what wires are going where and why. Um, another thing to consider is I would always use a high grade HDMI cable, at least 4K, you know, something nice, something that's gonna be reliable. Don't cheap out on HDMI cable. 
you're going to regret it. It's going to happen. I do this every day and I see it happen. And it's unfortunate because once the walls are up, it's a much different story to put a new HDMI cable in. Another note on that is to definitely run CAT cable. I always run a few CAT cables from the projector back to the rack in case the HDMI does fail for whatever reason, or if we want to convert category cable to audio, video, uh, IR data, whatever it is, we have CAT cables in place. CAT can be converted to almost any other cable, whether it's optical, RCA, um, coaxial, pretty sure you can do over coax. You can even do USB, CAT over U USB over CAT cable. Um, so origin and destination established. Now it's time to grab our wire, you know, grab our nice fancy wire. See, we have CAT. I'll be honest, I just wanted to show you the cat because I love cats, but it's so cool. <laughs> it really is cool. Anyway, <laughs> if you haven't tell by my t-shirts, <laughs> I love kittens. So now once the origin and destination of the circuits are established, you can begin to pull your wires to this destination. This includes clearing the wire path, setting and clearing the wire path. And what I mean is if you're traversing the studs, it means drilling out the studs. Now there's specific protocols and practices to drilling out studs. You know, you have to be a certain distance from the top or the bottom of the stud. We should be avoiding electrical wires. You know, low voltage and high voltage should take a separate path. I wouldn't recommend at least 18 inch distance. Um, there's certain things you have to know that are, let's say different state to state. Like if you're traversing up to down, floor to floor, or even sometimes there's fire stops in the sides of the wall, but I think that's a whole separate discussion and or video. We're gonna get these circuits built and we'll take you along that process a little bit along the way. So we'll get some work done and we'll check back in and I don't know, <laughs> thank you. All right, buddies, let's see some progress. Let's see how this thing played out. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so. We'll start at the front screen wall. So we left off covering origin destination, placing our gangs, and getting ready for the circuits to traverse the wire path. So a couple of things we should note here. Yes, this is the destination for our wire, but look how it was terminated. Look at, so, and what I mean by terminated is the wire came in from the top. It used a nice little hole that we have here in a low voltage gang. Wire got sent through the bottom hole and then back up and we, we, we basically taped the head right here. So a couple things this does. One, we can never lose our wire. It'll always be here no matter what happens with the drywallers, framers, uh, whatever, painters. Our wire will always be there. All we have to do is break this tape and we can simply pull our wire out, wire it to the terminals and do a finished wall plate, look real nice. And then we can banana in our tower speakers. Uh, another thing we should note is that Although low voltage here in my state doesn't have the same standards or requirements that the National Electrical Code provides for 120 volt circuits, we like to staple our wires just to keep them neat and clean, ensure they don't go anywhere. Uh, it looks more professional, it feels more professional. It's kind of just the right thing to do, you know? Um, another thing I will note here in the state, we don't have to go through all the studs. We can traverse behind if the walls gap, so you will see some of that. Um, I like to keep the cutting at a minimum. Um, if we don't have to cut into all the studs, why cut into all the studs? Um, as long as the job is, you know, let's say has integrity and that we can ensure it's gonna be long lasting in this fashion, I have no problem doing it. It's more efficient too. So less labor for the homeowner as well. Save you some money there. Um, these are wires traversing for the center channel. They, they drop down. So note that I, I drill out and I send them down the same side of the stud that the gang, the receptacle is going to be on. Um, this just seems to be the best way to do things. If there's electrical, we go behind it. Again, we make sure to staple down our wires. The wires come in the top, through the bottom, and then the heads come back up. You see this guy? So when it's install day, we simply pull our wire through, bang, bang. We have the head of the wire, we break the tape, and then we can pull it out completely. But again, the whole thing is that you send it in through this top hole, this is here for a reason, and the wire will never go anywhere. It's always recommended to use, you know, pre-construction brackets, the orange low voltage ones, if you can. I don't even know any other way I would do this. <laughs> um, but let's take a look at the circuit path. So that center channel, that's the left speaker. We have the subwoofer, very similar. Um, I like to leave my blue tapes up, just so when the, uh, 
drywallers come, they know that like this is a sub or this is audio or whatever it says here. Kind of a point of reference. It's good to just have everyone on site informed. A lot of times the way these things take place is we'll be here one day, electrical will be here another day, framers will be here another day. It all doesn't happen the same day and there's reasons for that. So we don't get you know in each other's ways, but like I said, not everyone's here at the same time. I can't, I don't have the time or the place to do a briefing for everybody. So it's good to provide information when we can for the other people on site. So the main wire path follows the top there where all the wires for the front array come in. This is one of the surrounds. We hit it there. Very similar termination and fashion comes in the top. Can't go anywhere. She's good to go now and forever. The other thing is you should have a certain distance. I would recommend at least a foot. Sometimes we do two or three feet depending on the actual what speaker is gonna go there. But you have to make sure you have enough wire to do your job during the post installation process. Now we've tested a few methods for traversing, let's say long runs like this, even if you're within a stud bay. Um, we've done Romex staples, we've done zip ties with screws, the little screw hole in them. We've done, Romex staples and Velcro. We've done Romex staples and zip ties. Um, I like to kind of experiment on site when I have the time and place to do so to see just what is the best. I'm currently or oh, I'm always proactively refining the process. And for this site, it was very efficient to just hop into a stud every now and then. You see there's, there's no studs here, but we hop in a stud there. It holds the weight of the wire. We hop in a stud there, there, and there. So hitting a few studs, every three to five studs in between, See, they're just hanging back there. This isn't always the case. The wall's not always gapped, but for this site, this seemed to be a really good approach. It was very efficient, and it's actually holding the wires in place really well. They look pretty clean. Um, I haven't done really this method before. Normally I go a little bit crazy and do like one Velcro and screw per bay, or a Romex staple with a little Velcro loop around it, which is nice too, but Based on the fact that the ceiling is sealed off up there, I didn't, that and I just didn't see it necessary to drill out all those studs up there. You know, it is structural, it's not a big deal. You can see they're drilling out all the studs up there for the high voltage wiring, but if we can avoid making any damage, that's kind of what it is, you know? We didn't have to drill them all out. And um, I guess the structural integrity stays more intact in this sense. Even though again, you see like, look at this very large pipe going through the studs. No big deal, but hey, why not try to do what's right, you know, when we can. So let's take a look at the projector wiring now. I want to get a ladder over there for you guys. Ugh. So this is the projector whip. And in the biz, we call these whips. Like this is a whip. You see this 120 volt. That's a whip right there. Um, lighting don't have a whip because the baffles are up but we consider this a whip. We call these whips, little rough in whips. So let's look at our projector whip. A couple of things to note here. The wires are all taped together. Um, we have uh, several warnings on here, particularly because this is a fiber cable. It's more delicate than let's say a category cable or audio cable or even RG6 coaxial. Caution, fragile, be careful, gentle. I try to do anything I can to mitigate this wire being broken by another contractor. Now, another thing is, you will note that these don't get, this could be looped together and hung higher. You know, it's kind of in the way, but the reason I don't loop it is because when they put the drywall up, they're gonna have to cut a hole for this receptacle, right? They're gonna have to cut a hole for that. And they're gonna have to pull these wires through the drywall hole so they can put the piece of drywall up. In my opinion, it's better to just leave this as a straight line, tape it together, make it as easy as possible for the drywallers to do their job. Because if I bundle this up and tape it up, they're gonna try to cut the tape. You know, they're gonna run a knife on the tape, risking my wires, or they're just gonna try to rip the tape apart. Again, putting my wires in jeopardy. Um, so I leave this as one long whip. I also put several cautions and notes so that we can protect it as best we can. Now, the projector mounting location is marked out right here. That light's gonna go away. This is simply here for the work site. Um, we have a low voltage receptacle here. And then we have, sorry, the light's kind of offsetting the camera a little bit. We have markings, outlet for projector. This is for the electrician to come in, throw me a 120 volt circuit right there, receptacle. Um, one last thing you should note is uh, re strain relief. So like, 
As opposed to these wires being strained or held up on the gang, I like to do a Velcro or Romex staple, something to hang them off. You could do a J-hook here, it's a little bit overkill for just a few circuits. I guess we will note one more thing. I like to do at least three category cables, one HDMI per projector circuit. More optimal would be two HDMIs just in case, but with three category cables, we can get ethernet, we can get IR data transmission, we can have a backup for the HDMI in case it does fail in 10 years from now. Um, also, I would use CAT6 um, minimum. CAT6A would be great because Steve, I don't know if you know this, but CAT6A is gonna be good for like an 8K HDMI conversion. You know what I'm saying? CAT6 is suitable. I don't know if CAT6 will be suitable for 8 and 10K. I can't say that. <laughs> I can't tell you if that's true, but I know CAT6A, you will be able to convert to 8K, you know, data transmission, 10K, 120 Hertz, you know, these higher bandwidth. And the reason is probably mostly because the CAT6A is, I would say, I think the standard's 500 megahertz where CAT6 is 250 megahertz. It's a bandwidth thing. So, um, one more thing to note. Again, we told you guys, you should be getting data back to the rack. So this home, this homeowner, he doesn't run cable boxes, but just in case he ever decides, hey, let me get some cable service. I got a theater. I got a really cool setup. I want to get a cable box. The last run we're doing is, I, I told Steve, let's, let's get a coax line just in case we're going to get a cable feed. I'd rather do a hardwired box than a wireless box. The feed looks so much better. It's not pixelated, not distorted, not crazy. With a hardwired coaxial connection, we'll have a really nice cable feed here. Um, it's good to take preventative measures. I asked the homeowner, I said, are you ever gonna do a cable box? He said, nah, no way, I don't even own cable boxes. Comes down about two hours later, right, Steve? <laughs> He's like, what if I put a cable box here? I was like, dude, I'm just running you a line because <laughs> let's just avoid any <laughs> nonsense. So we have a line in place. That's the last uh, run, the coaxial right there. Let's take a look at this rack whip. Again here, so we don't wanna hang all the wires straight off the receptacle. Um, we went with several uh, Velcros. The Velcro is suspending the wires and holding the weight off themselves. They're not pulling on anything but these Velcros. Really nice stuff, you did a good job. Uh, I guess the last piece of this thing would be to strain these wires. And they're not all data, otherwise we use a wire strainer, but Strain all these wires, make them look pretty, and throw some Velcros on there, and we'll get a nice bundle going. And I'll make sure to bring you in on that and show you how it looks in the end. Sorry, the lighting is crazy. <laughs> all right, sorry about that. So we'll finish this up, and uh, we'll check back in. I guess one last thing is to, uh, again, check over all your work, make sure everything is in order. We're going to bring the homeowner down here. We're going to debrief him. Anytime I leave a site, I like to debrief. Go over everything to mitigate any oversight, make sure everyone's happy, make sure everything got done to spec. If anything needs correction, we can correct it here and now on site and keep everyone happy. But yeah, I think that's about it. Um, one last thing is, if you're drilling out woods, uh, make sure you clean up. Don't leave this place a mess for the other contractors. I know it's an active working site, you know, it's a bare floor, but it's not cool to make a mess. Let's uh, clean up after ourselves. It's a matter of professionalism. Take care of each other on site, buddies. All right, buddies, we are all set here. So I just wanna show you guys the final finished product here at the rack location. Wires come out of the gang, and we threw a J-hook here to hang them off the floor. It's very important, again, protect your circuits. There's other people on site here. Someone steps on this HDMI, they're probably gonna break it, especially the head. So J-hooks are great for hanging wires, suspending them while not straining them. So, like I said, we, we made some nice branches. We got a white branch, we got a black branch, and we have some beautiful Velcros here. She's looking beautiful, ready for the rack. On the day of install, rack will go in, wires will slide through the back, and then we'll get our components in. This is the whip that we're leaving, not tied up for a reason. One other little tip I'll give you guys, always tape your HDMI heads. If any powder dust, especially drywall dust, sanding dust, paint gets into the little pin set, HDMI is totally done. Very, very difficult situation to fix. Now, front screen wall, we ended up with four LV1s or orange single gang units. Uh, and then we have an orange box there for the bookshelf, orange box there for projector. And then we have a wall box here. This is like a retrofit box. And that's about it. I would say, 
this pre-wire is completed. The last step, like I said, bring the homeowner down, go over with the homeowner, make sure to mitigate any oversight here, but otherwise she's looking great. Um, I really hope you appreciate the content I'm putting out for you guys. It takes me time and effort to do so. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.